Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you back to Canton. Uh, also, for those of you at home, we would like to uh, welcome you. As always, we are a little bit out of order in our rotation of how we do our normal services. So if you want to get your elements ready, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and say an opening prayer. We'll go straight into a short communion meditation, and uh, then we'll have a moment of silence as Tony gets ready to bring us the message. So, uh, with that being said, I just want to start us out with a little prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we once again come before you today with humbleness and gratefulness for what you have provided for us. And Father, we uh, know there's a heightened anxiety at this time. Father, we ask that your peace and comfort lie upon us. And Father, we thank you for the graciousness you continue to provide for us each and every single we ask these things in your son in Jesus' name. In Philippians 4, uh, Paul reminds us to always rejoice in the Lord. And he continues on to say, be anxious for nothing, because the Lord is near. And I think that's very prevalent at this time. God is with us. God is near. And it's no different than the night that Jesus was sacrificed. And he gathered his disciples in the upper room. And while there, he, broke, he gave thanks and broke the bread. And he said, this is my body. It's part of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup. And he passed it around and said, this is my blood. That I will pour out for you. Likewise, give thanks. As we go on this time of meditation, communion with your Savior.
couple of announcements. Uh, we are doing life group this next week on Wednesday night. That begins at 6.30, and we are studying from the book of Philippians, uh, where Paul says, be anxious for nothing. That's kind of the, the theme of our life group. It's also the theme kind of of our sermon series for the next few weeks here. So if you'd like to be a part of that, join us. Uh, 6.30 right here in the Life Center, and we will have tables set up and spread out and all that that sort of thing to recognize social distancing. Uh, other than that, I don't know that we have any other announcements. VBS, we have canceled VBS. We will do schedule VBS maybe for a one-day VBS a little later on once we kind of get a handle on where things are going. And as you can see, we are out here today instead of over at the church today. And We'll be praying that things get uh, get better and we get back into the church, get back things back to normal. But between now and then, we'll do the best we can. Amen. Amen. We'll do the best we can. Amen. Amen. Okay, there we go. There we go. Any other announcements this morning? No, how about prayer requests? I know we've had several people that we've been praying for. Uh, I know we've been praying for our nation. We've been praying for... Some people that's been afflicted. Is there anyone that uh, you'd like to add to the prayer list? Yes, ma'am. Sharon, so first, she just got diagnosed with cancer. We're praying for Sharon in Jesus' name. Any others this morning you'd like to add? I want to put Denny Shule on the prayer list also. They diagnosed him with bladder cancer, so we want to be praying for Denny in Jesus' name. Any others this morning that you'd like to add? Yes. Um, my dad has been on the board. He's still one of the RAs. Be praying for it's Chad, right? Be praying for Chad in Jesus' name. Any others this morning? Tony, we need to remember all of the young people that are going off to the military. Um, we saw on Facebook that service yesterday that was in town for, from all the local schools, all the yes. men and women that are that are leaving soon. Yeah, we want to remember our military. Be praying for them, praying for those young men, young women. Anything else that they would you'd like to add to our prayer list this morning? If not, let's continue worshiping this morning.
Heavenly Father, how good it is to be in your house again. We thank you for this time together. We ask for your patience with us, the things going on here. Uh, we ask for your healing hand on the world as things continue to uh, get a little better, it seems. But we ask for your guidance in all things, your direction. We pray for your safety. And we thank you for Jesus, who means everything to us. And this we pray in his name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat as we continue worshiping this morning. Let's up on the count of three. Let's everybody say big hugs since we can't greet each other. So one, two, three. Big hugs.
it's not uh, it's not the way we typically do things, but if we hang with it, we will get through it. And uh, we are uh, starting a new series this morning, and this series is born out of our life group study, and it's one that I think that all of us can relate to, especially in this season of our lives. And this uh, life group study that we're studying now is called Anxious for Nothing. It comes out of a, a verse in Philippians 4. And if you want to follow uh, the series that we have, the preaching series, or even look at any of our past series, uh, you can always go to our website at Camp Christian Church uh, at myccclife.com, or you can follow us on Facebook, uh, where, where all of our sermons are there on Facebook. So, as I said, the scripture that's, that's driving this series is Philippians 4, verses 4 through 6. And just to kind of set the context, the Apostle Paul is writing this piece of scripture in a letter that he wrote to the church at Philippi. And he's writing it from jail. So, as we read these next few words here, think about being in prison, uh, the hopelessness that he might have faced. He was... He knew he was facing imminent death at some point. Uh, you know, there was no way around where he was at. And think about that as we read this piece of scripture. Uh, he writes it and he says this. This is Philippians 4, 4 through 6. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, can you imagine someone, you know, in prison facing execution? Saying that, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And here's the key phrase. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, here's something that I find extremely interesting. Is that word anxious? Uh, when you look at the root word that the anxious comes from, it literally means to take away your breath. Now let me ask you, have you ever been in a situation where you felt so much anxiety that you just couldn't hardly breathe? I mean, just kind of took your breath away. At some point in your life, you know, either by some choices that you, you've made on your own or some choices that you're maybe going to have to make, you found yourself feeling anxious and it just almost took your breath away. I think every one of us has been. You know, maybe for you it's confrontation, you know, and we're going to talk about that in the next few weeks. And maybe you had to confront a family member or a friend and, you know, you spent the entire night, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I've done this, spent the entire night going through every scenario and the, the what ifs. Well, what if they say this or what if they do this or what if he hits me in the nose, you know, and I go through all the what if scenarios. For some of you, maybe that anxiety comes with dealing with debt. You know, you made some bad calls or some bad choices, spent some money in some places you probably shouldn't have, and now things are not going quite as good as they were, and you've got bills to pay, and money's pretty tight, and all of a sudden you have this anxiety about your financial situation. For some of you, your anxiety is caused by family members, maybe even kids, you know, and in spite of giving them some good direction and and they decided that they're going to go left when they should have went right. And you see all the writing on the wall. You know what's going to happen. And the problem is no one wants to listen to you. And your heart's breaking because you know what's coming for their lives. And all of a sudden, it begins to captivate your every thought. And your worry for them has just gone to this next level of anxiety. And for some of us, we simply just look around at the world today and the situations that's going on in our world today and the, the things that we're facing, and we've just become overwhelmed. And literally, we're fearing for our lives and the lives of our family, maybe the future. We begin to wonder, you know, is there really going to be any future for me or my family? Now, these are all different situations, but they all have one thing in common. They all have the potential... To leave us feeling very anxious and if we leave those things unchecked, we can easily become overwhelmed. So for the next couple of weeks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at what Scripture has to say about how we can avoid allowing ourselves to slip into that deep, dark pit of anxiety. Now, if you have your Bibles today, we're going to be going to the book of Kings in the Old Testament. I want to begin our series by talking and looking at three very common thoughts 
that captive that take captive our hearts. And these thoughts, they will almost always put us in a position that later down the road leads us to being anxious. And I want to give you these three thoughts right up front. And I want you to, to say these along with me if you would. These three thoughts are simply this. I want it. You can say that. I need it. I need it. And I deserve it. That, that's the three thoughts that, that we use for the most to justify the decisions that we make. And I don't know about you, but I've used all three of these. I've used all three of these. Now, let me be clear. There are times when there are things that you need. And there are times it's okay to want. And there are times that, yes, you do deserve something. But what I'm going to tell you is that left unchecked, these three means of justification can lead us to areas in our life where if we're not very careful, we wind up with a lot of regret and a whole lot of anxiety. So if you have your Bibles, or if you want to, you can follow along on the screen. We're going, going to the Old Testament, to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 21, and we're going to camp out here for the next couple of weeks. Uh, and, and what I want to do is I want to look at a story about a king in the Old Testament, but he's not just any old king. This man considered himself to be the top dog of kings. He wouldn't be outdone. He was just, you know, his prayer, his image of his life was just, just bigger than his life. He had this huge ego. And his name was Ahab. And you may not have ever heard of, of King Ahab, but I bet you heard of his wife. His wife was named, anybody know? Jezebel. 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 Now, just curiosity here. Does anybody know any little girls out there named Jezebel? <laughs> no, no. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. The most evil king and queen in the Hebrew history was Ahab and Jezebel. In fact, the Bible says that Ahab was the most wicked king of all time. You know, most kings, they get just a few verses or maybe even a chapter in the Bible. But Ahab and Jezebel, they get four full chapters of their evil exploits. And there's tons and tons of detail. And that's why I always say that the Bible has to be true because there's just so much detail. In most history books, we don't get this type of detail. Now, before I jump in, I want to let you know, as we look at this story, you're going to be tempted to look at this and think, you know what, I'm never going to be like that guy. I'm, I'm never going to be that wicked. I'm never going to be that evil. But here, here's what I want you to remember. The Bible tells us that all of these things that happened with Ahab and Jezebel, they started out very small. They started out very small. The thing that caused God to just be done with Ahab is something that you and I, we flirt with all the time. This thing that caused God to remove his hand of blessing, even to a point where the Bible says, uh, you know, goes into this gruesome detail about Ahab and how Jezebel will die. It's something that every single one of us have flirted with at one time or another. Now, to set the context of the story today, Ahab, king of Israel, he had his heart set on something. He had become consumed. He was consumed by this desire to have a piece of property that wasn't his. He wanted it not so he could build himself a new palace, but he wanted it so that he could plant a vegetable garden that he could see from his window. So here's the story. 1 Kings 21. I want you to look at this and kind of see how our desires might kind of fit into this story. So verse 1 begins this way. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel. Close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So this is how it all begins. You know, he's looking at his window and he sees the vineyard. Verse 2. Ahab said to Naboth, Let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it is so close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or, if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see this and I read this, this doesn't look like something evil. doesn't look like there's any malice in this. In fact, it just looks like a really good business deal. You know, it looks like something that's probably more than fair for Nathan. But 
before we move on, I want to ask you a question. When was the last time that you really wanted something? You know, Ahab, he had this desire. He wanted a garden close to his palace. When was the last time that you wanted something so bad that in your heart it come to a point where it just consumed <coughs> your thoughts and maybe even your life? When was the last time you had something? Maybe it was the newest phone out there. I know every time that we, we go to the mall or we go into town, you know, my son, our is <coughs> looking for the newest, the best, the, the, the most ridiculous phone that you can find. It will do anything for you. You know, maybe it was a, a new computer or maybe it was a certain him or a certain her. You know, maybe it was a new home or a car or a truck or... Maybe it was that 21-foot bass boat with GPS thrown on the motor one <laughs> and, and the extended casting deck on both ends. Not that I've given it much thought. <laughs> <laughs> but when was the last time you really wanted something that became consumed? When, when was that last time? And my question is, is there really anything wrong with that? I mean, is there anything really wrong with just wanting something? It's not like we're, we're looking for new wants. I don't know about you, but I don't go out looking for something that I want to want to think about all the time. It just kind of shows up. I mean, you're you're walking through the mall one day and you see the newest electronics, and there it is. You know, I told Todd in there at Ace Hardware. You know, I've saved a ton of money over the past month because I wasn't able to go into the store, and every time I walk into Ace Hardware, I see something shiny that I gotta have, and I buy it. You know, I mean. You know, I don't know about you, but it's not like we go looking for new ones, is it? You know, they just kind of show up, don't they? And you know how it is. You're just walking around down the Louisville Sport Boat and RV Show. And there she is, 21 foot, metal flake, glistening black outboard. It's been a cat <laughs> Not that I've given it much thought. <laughs> it's not like you go looking for new ones, is it? We don't do that. They just seem to find us, don't they? And all of a sudden, you know, you, you get to thinking about it, and you got to have it. you got to have it. I want it. I need it. And you know what? I deserve it. I work hard. I deserve it. Now, we've all been there. We've all been there. Some of us, it's a job. You know, we were completely and perfectly content until we found out what somebody else made. And all of a sudden, we got to have a new job. You know, so it's, it's a house. And, you go over to a friend's house and you take a look at that new kitchen and that bath. And you know, they've got two of them and, man, that's, that's what I want. But what happens when a want becomes more than just that? You know, what happens when a want becomes so consuming that want moves from a want to a need and then we justify it by saying, you know what, I deserve it. At least I deserve it more than they do. You know, it's not like food, it's not like shelter, it's not like water. This is like a need that I just can't get past. It's just taking over my life kind of need. You know, someone else has this thing and we want it and we deserve it too. We justify our personal wants and needs. And here's the thing, you can hear it in our culture's language. I mean, all the time you'll hear this, well, you know, if, you, if that's what you want, you should go for it. You should go after it. You know, we've all had that desire. But did you know that the Bible has a word for this kind of a consuming want that becomes a need and becomes justified? The Bible actually has a word for that. The word is this. It's covenant. It's covenant. Covenant is when a want that someone else has is something they have. When a want becomes so intensified that it becomes unhealthy. Now... Coveting, that's an old school word. We don't use that much today. In fact, I, I don't know about you, but I haven't used the word coveting this week. Anybody use the word coveting this week? No, I mean, I, I, I haven't. You know, probably should have a couple of times. But, but I didn't. I didn't. And one of the reasons that we, we drop words like this is the same reason we've dropped other words like dowry or eight-track tapes or rotary phones. Some of you don't even know what those things are because culturally we, we kind of progressed past all of that, haven't we? In fact, we actually encourage our children to have deep and desirable wants. I mean, that's the American way, isn't it? That's just the American way to have more, to live better, to just 
go for it, even to a point that in our culture that we often gauge our self-worth by the wants and the needs and the things that we accumulate. And what we've done is we've done this, and this is the ugly part. The ugly part is we've taken a sin and we've made it a value. We've taken wants and we've taken needs and we've turned them into profit. The pursuit of what we really, 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 really want and what we just have to have. You know, that's a value in our society. And we have elevated coveting to a point that we don't even think of it as a sin anymore. We've done that with some other stuff. You know, think about this murder and stealing. Yeah, they're a sin. We know that. But how many times do you ever think about coveting? You just don't think about it. I mean, think about what we say if you don't have this intense desire to pursue these wants and needs in your life. We always say about people like that, we say, well, they don't have any drive. Or they don't have any ambition. You know, or maybe they're just anti-American. But when we elevate pursuing our wants to a point that we will do anything, we will jump through any hoop, we will overcome any obstacle, we will climb that ladder no matter how many, how many times we have to, to kick somebody out of the way, you know, we'll remove any obstacle that gets in our way, whatever it takes, no matter what the consequences, when we do that, then we set aside the sin of covenant. And we set aside God's command of thou shalt not covenant. And ultimately, this is the very thing that caused God to say, you know what, Ahab and Jezebel, I'm done. I'm done blessing you. I'm done with you. But here's the question. How do we know when we're really covenant? And I'll tell you what, as, as we unfold this story, we're going to see that it's really easier to recognize than what you might think. Now, Ahab has just made his offer to David. I want you to look at David's response here. Verse 3. Here's how he responds. He says, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance that was passed down by my ancestors. In other words, he's playing a God card here. And, and what you've got to understand is, is this was just something bigger than just a piece of dirt. Okay, this wasn't a field. This wasn't a piece of dirt. This was actually this man's inheritance that had been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And what happened was, as, a, as a, a, an Israelite, they would give you this piece of ground and you were to be the steward of this piece of, of land. It was entrusted to your family. And this is your identity. It's literally your identity in, with the people of God. And he says, I'm, I can't do that. I can't give that away. Now I want you to look at how Ahab responds. Verse 4. Here's how he responds. So Ahab went home angry and sullen because of Naboth's answer. The king went to bed with his face to the wall and refused to eat. Now, isn't that something that a middle schooler would do? <laughs> Not a king. I mean, that's something that kid would do. You would expect pouting for a kid like that, but not a king, not an adult, you know, sticks his face against the wall so he just couldn't see anything else. And he couldn't eat. I don't know about you, but i got to be really upset if I can't eat. <laughs> now let me ask you something. How many of you really, really wanted something so bad that you, and you just didn't get it? And, and because of that, you just couldn't see anything else and it just made you so sick you couldn't eat. Have you ever been in that position? Honestly, I haven't. Well, that's where Ahab was. And it began to rule his emotions. It began to rule his thoughts. And it, it's ultimately what happens to us when we become fixated and we become captivated by obtaining what we want and what we think we need in our life. And it begins to rule our emotions and rule over our thoughts. And it causes us to respond in ways that are not Christ-like. Everyone here has said something because they had an emotional response. They said something and they didn't get what they want. And later on, you regret it. It causes us to respond in a way that is not Christ-like. I want you to look at how Ahab goes ahead and he responds. Verse 5. What's the matter, his wife Jezebel asked him? What's made you so upset that you're not eating? King replies, he says, I asked Naboth to sell me his vineyard or trade it, but he refused. Now, once again, this sounds like a conversation between a mother and a child. 
in verse 7, she says, Are you the king of Israel or not? Just wait a minute. Get up and eat something and don't worry about it. I'll get you Naboth's vineyard. And that's exactly what she did. In fact, the Bible goes on to tell us that she had Naboth falsely accused, dragged out into the street, and murdered all over a king's want. And the reality is, is that Ahab, being the king he was, he went right along with it and he justified it. Because he's the king. And the king wanted a vineyard. And he went on to do some horrible, horrible, horrible things because he learned early on how to justify his actions to obtain his wants. See, most of us, all we need is someone to tell us that we deserve it. We deserve it and that we should just go after it. Just give us a little bit of encouragement and what happens is that thing that has captured our attention or captivated our emotions, it takes root in our heart. And I'll be honest with you, it looks like this. This is the way you can tell. What you covet, you end up crowning king, and it will rule your life. And the reality is for you and for me is that we know what it's like to get our hearts set on something. To get our mind wrapped around obtaining that thing that we want. To allow a, a need to become something bigger. We know what that's like to chase after something. And the Bible tells us that Ahab was consumed with this. To a point that not eating or facing the wall and not seeing anything else. Well, let me ask you. What happened the last time you really, really wanted something and you didn't get it? Did it consume your thoughts? Did it consume your emotions? You see, the way that you can tell if you're coveting, whether you've crossed that line or not, when something becomes king over your life, and that something begins to rule your thoughts and rule your emotions, it's all that you can think about. And when you get to that point, you're in danger. You're in absolute danger because it can cause you to do things, to say things, to make some reckless decisions that you normally wouldn't make or to end up in a place that you normally wouldn't be. And if you want to experience anxiety in life like you never have before, then all you have to do is to become consumed. To allow that something to become king over your life. All you have to do, all you have to do is cover it. So here's the question. Here's the question you've got to ask yourself. What rules my attention and my emotion? What's that thing that is dominating your attention and your emotions? And I'll be honest with you. If you don't know, ask your spouse. Ask a friend. Chances are they see it every single day. What's the thing that you talk about the most? What's the thing that is capturing your attention? What's those things that you get angry about, that you get frustrated about, you're very emotional about? Ask yourself, what rules my attention and my emotions? And you will identify something that possibly you're coveting in your life. Because coveting starts right here. It starts in the heart, long before it ever moves out there. And it leads to the second reason that coveting is so dangerous for us. The second reason coveting is so dangerous for us because coveting is a private sin that always goes public. It starts as something that's inside of us, but it never stays there. It always goes public. It starts inside, but eventually it seeps out into every action and every aspect of your life. So here's the question that we need to ask ourselves. is this. What is it that you secretly want? And why is it that no one else knows about? What are you secretly chasing? What are you hoping that no one ever finds out about? Because that's where the danger starts. It's in your heart as a want, as it grows from a want, all to a need, all to being justified, all in secret. But I'll tell you, eventually, it will go public. Now, here's the hard part. The Bible tells us that this is just good old-fashioned sin. It's not a problem. It's not something that we just need to work on. It's sin. Coveting is a sin.
And you know what the Bible tells us that we should do with that? It's another old school word that we don't use a lot anymore. You don't hear a lot anymore. The Bible tells us that we need to repent. And that involves confession. It involves asking forgiveness. And it involves choosing a new direction and moving in that direction and never looking back. It's agreeing with God that this is a sin and asking his help to move in a new direction and let go of that old king in your life. So here's how I want to close today. Many of us, you know in your heart, you know in your mind uh, what it is that's captured your attention. And, and you know what it is that makes you just sick and tired of the anxiety that goes along with it. Some of us were not really sure. So I'm just not sure. So I'm going to help you. I'm going to read a series of questions. And I, I want you, if you would, to just let your mind objectively consider some of these questions. Because it might just cause you to consider what it is that you're secretly chasing and hoping that no one ever finds out. So the first question is simply this. What happens when they sell out of that thing that you want the most? How do you respond? What happens when someone else gets the job or the position that you want? What happens when you go to someone else's house and you see all the things that they have? What happens when you hear how other husbands treat their wives or how other wives treat their husbands? What happens in your heart? What is that thing that disappoints you? And what is that thing that makes you angry that just seems to be eluding you? What is that thing that makes you sad because you think you'll never get it or you'll never have it no matter how hard you try? What do you want that no one else knows about? What is it that you are chasing and that you hope no one else ever finds out about? What do you want that you think will make you happy? Now, to be honest with you, what came to mind? Let me ask you, is it worth shrinking your life down to that one little thing? Because that's what happened with Ahab and Jezebel. They had a whole kingdom. They had an entire kingdom. But it shrunk down to a piece of land for a vegetable crop. That's what happens when we become consumed by gain. We often lose our perspective of everything else just to gain that one single thing that we think we have to have. And let me ask you this. Is it really worth that? Is it really worth lying awake at night, running through every scenario of what might happen or the what ifs in your life? Well, the Apostle Paul would say to you today, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request. God. And here's the promise, and I love this promise. His promise is that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Be anxious for nothing. Let's pray as we close today. Father God, we just thank you for the gift of life, for the gift of, of your word, Father, that we might feast on as we feast on bread. And Father, for each one of us, there has always been something in our, our lives that maybe we've held on to. Maybe it's something that we see that our neighbors have that we just think we have to have. And Father, we ask you to help us to overcome it. Forgive us for our sins. And Father, give us new life by showing us what we have and how we can be grateful for those things. Father, for us, as we close today, I just simply want to give this invitation to the ones that have never called upon the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior. That this be the time that they are saved. Because, Father, we know that ultimately everything that we would want and everything that we would need, it's just something that's going to fall away with time. The only thing that will last is your mercy and your grace and the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. That is the only thing. So, Father, for those who never chose that, we pray for you. And we pray for ourselves that we are reminded that we have been given so much more than just possessions. We have been given your love. And, Father, we are called to love others. So, Father, we ask that you would convict us, that you would help us.
us to do that. Forgive us. In Jesus' name. Amen. But actually, this morning, if you would, let's stand as we close. God is living.